years later, I'm trying to go into my memory and try to like, you know, to dig out why did I do it? What did I, why did I try to fake it? I don't feel good. Like it was serious. I was suffering pain uh, because they did all of these tests, like me needles and like, you know, like they put me a needle. They thought I have cancer because I faked it that I have cancer. Hello, my name is Frida Weisel. And on this channel, I explore the story of Hasidic Jews. Today, for my long-form interview series, I will be talking to Ellie Benedict about his life story. In October 2023, I flew to Israel to meet with Ellie Benedict for a tour of his hometown in Hasidic Nibrak, near Tel Aviv, Israel. The tour was filmed as a separate segment for my YouTube channel, which I invite you to check out. Ellie Benedict has been on quite a life journey. He grew up in B'nai Brak, went to Hasidic educational institutions, got married in a marriage match, and later left. Like me, he has worked as a tour guide in the world he comes from. And like me, I hope I can say that this is my impression. He has a warm interest in the world without subscribing to its way of life. In my tour with Ellie, we visited his childhood home and were welcomed by his mother, father, wife and son, I saw pictures of Ellie's childhood and the place where Ellie got married in his Hasidic marriage. But we could only cover limited content in a single short video, so today I wanted to do a more casual, long-form interview to talk more about his journey, anything and everything, unconstrained by editing demands. Let me tell you a little bit about Ellie Benedict today. Ellie is a scholar, artist, and activist for Yiddish. Ellie serves as the CEO of Young Yiddish, the Yiddish museum in a bus stop in Tel Aviv. He also serves as program director and recruitment at the League for Yiddish. Ellie is part of a research team at UCL in London, which studies Hasidic Yiddish and Ashkenazi Hebrew. Ellie's research interests are Ashkenazi culture, Hasidic culture, Yiddish, and Jewish dance. He is a folklore stage artist, a singer, dancer, and teacher of traditional performing arts. Today, Ellie lives in Canada with his wife and little son. Welcome, Ellie. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you for giving me the tour of Israel. Before we get started talking about your life, I wanted to ask, because I did another segment with you where we talked about the situation in Israel. Right after we filmed the segment in B'nai Barak, it was terrible, terrible October 7 attack, and then you were there. So I want to hear an update on that. Where are you now and how are you doing? So I'm currently in Canada, in, next to Montreal, in the town I live, a small village called La Prairie. Um, and I arrived here a week ago or so, uh, through Dubai. Um, this was the most available flights. Um, yeah, and I'm worried and praying for all of my family in Israel. You know, it's hard times. Yeah, you were going to stay a whole month. Yeah, yeah, I had a lot of work to do there uh, in the museum uh, for the League for Yiddish. Uh, and I couldn't uh, finish it, obviously, because of the situation. Um, and it also wasn't sure if I'm going to have a flight back in when. So I just decided to uh, go when I can. You feel, you seem a little sad about needing to go home, like abandoning your country. Yeah, it's abandoning my, you know, my people, my, some of my family, um, my job that I like, but, um, and it's also a sad thing that is happening. Yeah, it's not only sad that I'm leaving, it's, it's more sad what's happening. Um, but what can you do? We're all praying. Now, now we're going to talk about your life story because we, we, got a little glimpse of your world. I am really curious about how we come to be filming in the middle of your home, two people who are off the beaten path. And um, you, I felt so welcomed in B'nai Brak, and I'm sure that your life story has not been a linear journey. So I, I want to start by hearing, where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? So I grew up in B'nai Brak in a Hasidic family, like you mentioned. Uh, I grew up to a community called Karlin Stalin or Stalin Karlin. And my childhood, I, it was, you know, a happy childhood uh, growing in the Hasidic community in B'nai Brak. Uh, I went to the, the Haider, the school, and then to the yeshiva. I had a, a, a kind of open Hasidic uh, growing because uh, I was educated every stage in a different school. So... 
it's not, I didn't went to the, you know, to the school from the community from the first minute I was born until I, after the marriage, but I changed communities. I mean, I, it's called Klal Hasidish or like just general uh, schools for Hasidim. Um, so I, I was very lucky to have exposure to all kinds of different sub communities inside the Hasidic culture. How come your parents sent you to different uh, Hasidus? It's just because uh, the community, we belong to Karlin and my mom is coming from Vizhnitz and Karlin in Bnei Brak wasn't big. Like they had something like 80 families. And weirdly enough, the only cheder, the only school from Karlin in Bnei Brak is Litvish. Like Karlin has an institute and it's made for Litvish uh, boys and not for Hasidim. It's very weird, but that's how it happened. Um, so the only, and they speak Hebrew, they're not Yiddish. So in order for me to speak Yiddish and study in a Hasidic uh, school, I needed to go somewhere else. So they sent me to Machnovke called, uh, it's Eichal Aron, Eichel Aron, uh, Machnovke. And, um, I studied there, uh, from two years old until, uh, Bar Mitzvah until 13. Um, and then I went to a yeshiva and again, I went to a yeshiva, what is from a different community, Bobev, uh, what is also Klal Hasidi, like a lot of other uh, Hasidi communities are sending there their children. So I went to Bobev and this is for three years after from 13 until 16. And then I went to Jerusalem to study in the yeshiva from Karlin. Finally, I came to Karlin and went uh, to Jerusalem for until my marriage. Ah, uh-huh. so but you're you're one of two children, right? I'm one of two children, yeah, and it's rare in the Hasidic community. And outside of the community, it's normal. But growing up, I felt so different, and like that I don't have so many brothers and sisters, and uh, you know, like you know, families meet like eight is the minimum, and like <laughs> less from eight is either a young family that still didn't brought all of the children. Either like, you know, like, oh, they have just five kids. But <laughs> um, yeah, and the big families that you know is like mid-18. But I know so a family mid-20, 21. Like, so there is big families and you know them. Like, it's not only a rumor that is going around. You know these families. So yeah, two is very uh, small, but just my parents couldn't bring any children after me. So I have one sister that is bigger for me, mid three years. And then they had a break and then me. Uh-huh. When we visited your house, you slept with your sister in one room until bar mitzvah, and then you slept in sort of a little hallway on the way to the porch. Right, right. I, I, I've gotten a separate room, uh, I think a year before the bar mitzvah, maybe. Yeah, and then, uh, and then, yeah. And they build also the secret then, because uh, the big porch they build out, because uh, from the bar mitzvah, um, you, you should also sleep in the sukkah, the Sike, and it was small. Uh, the original Sike was very small. Only my father could sleep there. He, they needed to build, and then they built the Sike, and they built, uh, and they made this room, my room. And so I had this, like, my unit, the uh-huh. Sike. And it's, the, it's, yeah. <laughs> the Sike was also your unit? Well, I mean, yeah, they built it f- for me. For you to fit, yeah. to fit so you can sleep in the Sike. Yeah. Your, your parents probably spoiled you. Very spoiled, yeah. I'm very spoiled <laughs> and I'm very lucky that I, that it's like this. Uh, you said my parents are very welcomed and, and you can see it. It's not only because they have two children. It's also a part of, uh, you know, their character. Yeah. Yeah. Your, your mother is very creative. She's, she's, can I say she's a teacher? She seemed to be very, very creative, talented woman. Cause we saw some of the work she did with, uh, the ch- childhood albums that was very yeah, yeah. creative. Yeah, so my mom is very, very creative. In, but she's also an important uh, figure in the Hasidic community. I mean, she's not only a teacher; she's a teacher in the seminar, which is like uh, uh, women from uh, fifteen years, uh, uh, girls. Yeah, and uh, then she's also teaching um, in Hebrew. It's called a Bayit Yehudi, the Jewish home, how to build a Jewish home, and this is for uh-huh. older girls that are going to be married, like. Before, I think in 17, they have it. They have a class about it. And she was teaching it also in other schools, in schools from Karlin and, and so on. 
And then uh, she's also uh, a matchmaker and she's also teaching, uh, you know, uh, they, they call it in Israel, but it's like a guide for a Kale, for, a, for a, yeah, before the wedding. Uh. And uh, yeah, and she gives talks and she's like all, uh, she's a phenomenon. And then she's wow. also very creative, you know, with the ends and she's painting and yeah, she did a lot of things. Yeah. Wow. Can you tell me, maybe an anecdote or two about your childhood that will give us a sense of what your particular childhood was like. A anecdote. You can think, you can take a second to think. Yeah. Something that happened in Chaydet, in Yeshiva or at home. So I was a very curious boy as a child. And I, I didn't like, my mom is telling, is telling me always a story that one time I'm coming uh, from home and I'm painting um, you know, like a picture, a painting, something. And she sees that I'm painting uh, everything in black. And she asks me, what do you paint? And I'm saying, this is my classroom. This is my kite. And she's asking, so why is it? She has like, she's like, we called her a, psycho, a psychologic because she's like always psychologic. So why are you painting it black? Like what's, what's wrong? So I tell her, um, so I tell her, we got, I don't understand why you need to, you know, sit in this gray room on this like uh, ugly benches and like just, uh, why can't we study the same thing but outside on the grass? Why can't we go to, you know, to the park and study there? Um, so this was like very early. I was like probably four uh, or five. Uh, wow. Did you, did you express it as you got older? Did you express your sense of, maybe you felt like things should be different than the way they are? I truly did. And um, I think I expressed it in a whole various ways. And one of it was this painting. But uh, I think I was always searching for, I wouldn't say a way out, but like uh, to be more like open and accepting and I was growing up in a very strict uh, hider also. Like my my education wasn't easy. Like, uh, you know, it's like the time that I grew up still with like rebels beating the, ch the children in the school. And so I grew up with a lot of, you can say violence in the, in the school. And it wasn't an easy uh, part. I wasn't searching to escape. I was searching to make it better, you know, to sit in the grass, right? Like, like uh -huh. there are solutions for it. Yeah. And, and like all my years, I, I was fine. I was trying to find my way in it and, you know, not to break the the system or not to break the vessels. But you seem from what I'm hearing to have from a young age, not been of the box. You maybe weren't rejecting the system. You were thinking of solutions, but I think that makes you different right yeah i think so i think i think all of the people that are going out of the community have something in common and the thing is i think you need to have curiosity and you need you need to have courage enough to follow your curiosity i think before the uh, before the second world war a lot of uh, people left the you know the orthodoxy for uh, more open things because of uh, ideological reasons or because of, you know, they had big, uh, big ideas. They didn't believe in God. Yes, believe in God, not believe, but I think it's, it's changed now. And I think the people that are living are the people that are fighting the box. They are fighting the, the you know, the, the closed corners of, of being religious. That's why some of the people that are leaving the community are still staying, are still staying religious in, in a certain aspect. Uh -huh. That is very interesting. I definitely relate to it, but I'm, I'm not sure about staying religious in certain aspects. Is that common for people who leave? So there is people that are living in, I'm not religious, not religious at all. And most of the people that are leaving the community are, are also leaving to not be religious. But there is a lot of people... It, there is a lot of definition. In Israel, we call them Haredi modernim. 
all like uh-huh. Shababnikin, or like all kinds of names that are people that are not in line with the systems are not happy with the the way how you know the Haredi system is boxing up everything and they're trying to open but they're not they're not breaking the vessels and not they're still staying Haredi they call it of Haredi but you know they have a different uh, keeper like or like they're going with uh, they're doing certain other things and and there's another way, there's also people that are living to be Dati Leumi in, in Israel. Like, you know, just to be religious, Zion is religious, and not to be Haredi, what Haredi is like, the ultra-Orthodox. Or to be, you know, kind of Mesorati in Israel, we call it, what is like traditional, meaning they can believe in God, they can believe in the Torah, but they don't keep necessarily everything that the Allah had, the law, the religious law is saying. So there is a lot of this kind of people uh, that are leaving the community. But I think people that are considered living are mostly living entirely, like living the yeah, religion. Yeah. Yeah. We see this also in New York, uh, this phenomenon of the chill chassid, people um, stretching the boundaries of the community itself rather than exiting the community because of, of the trauma involved with the complete exit uh, is what I think. But but the narrow box is definitely being expanded by people who prefer not to leave, but still can fit in the narrow box. And there's been in New York at least a lot of room for that expansion. I is how I see it. What I observe. Yeah. Let's let's return to to your childhood because I like to go a little bit linearly. Tell me, for instance, if I were to talk to your school teachers from Haida, what would they say? What was Ellie like? I think it's changed in the middle. Um, I think I was a very good boy. Like I didn't do any trouble. I didn't do, you know, like they used to eat other children next to me, but I was got maybe one or two slumps on the face, but uh, you know, it's my patch, you know. (laughs) Two slaps. Yeah. But not something very significant. Like I saw other kids next to me suffering, like really suffering, like, you know, with sticks and with like very, very hard things that I don't know what happened with, it, with them today, but uh, for sure there is trauma out there. Um, so I was a good kid, but I wasn't fitting the box. So I think they, they would say I was a mediocre, like uh, some rabbi said I'm a snake under the straw. Like, what does that mean? Nachash mitachat akash. There is in Hebrew, there is a saying. It's like hidden talents? Is that what it means? No, the opposite. It's meaning like uh, you're lurking in, you know, under the bush. You're hiding under like a thing. You know? You're hiding your true mm-hmm. self. Like you're acting like a nice child, but you're, you're a snake, basically. Ah, uh, <laughs> I see. Yeah. <laughs> sure. who, would, who would have said that about you? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so I think this was because I was trying to, you know, checking the borders. So, but like they didn't have any excuse to say he's not a good kid, right? Like because on the book I was fine. Uh huh. So th- I think this was my childhood. Yeah. What was your faith like? The faith was strong. I think in my childhood yeah. I didn't like deal with faith. The faith came with like you know later in. Uh, I'm a child. I'm trying to play, to, you know, curious, to, I studied, I had a good, I, I still have a good head, right? Like, so you say it in English, a good head, a good mind. Like I, I know how to study and I studied good. Get a cup. I get a cup, yeah. Uh, I studied Talmud and I studied, you know, the Gemure and I studied, uh, I was a good boy, right? But uh, yeah. And then like after a while, when I was bigger, um, I had also um, a story with one of the rabbis in the in the cheder sexually assault me, and this is a thing that left uh, I think a big impression wow. uh, on me, and 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 this why I said that I was changed in the middle because I don't exactly remember when did it started, but I think it it made a big shift on my uh, you know trust in adults, trust and, and in the system or in any system. And this made me more a uh, rebellion, like trying, like in the beginning it was curious, but now it changed to, I'm going to rebel. I'm going to make like, you know, 
uh, I'm going to do something about it. And it shifted also a little bit to anger on the system. And yeah. Uh -huh. Did you, did you talk to anyone about it at the time? So I did to one of the, so I had one Rebbe, one uh, teacher that I really liked. He was from a different class. And when I went to complain, I was in a higher class. Like I was in, uh, I think in the ninth class, Kita Tess. And so it's the biggest, actually. I was uh, 11 then. And when I went to complain and the story was happening, I think a lot before it, but also until I was 11, but I had the guts to go and tell this Rebbe only when I was 11. And I have like a kind of mixed memories from when I'm small, because when I was very small in like Kita, Daled or Hey, I was faking it that I, that I don't feel good in order to escape from the, from the Haider. For a long time, for like months, I wasn't in the in the hider because I claimed that I'm not feeling good. That uh, and they went to do checks and doctors and stuff and like, yeah, I faked it really, really good. And uh, was it related to to was that a, related to the abuse you suffered? So that's what I'm questioning myself. I don't remember. And wow. like, but like. Years later, I'm trying to go into my memory and try to like, you know, to dig out why did I do it? What did I, why did I try to fake that I don't feel good? Like it was serious. I was suffering pain uh, because they did all of these tests, like mean needles and like, you know, like they put me a needle. They thought I have cancer because I faked it that I have cancer. I faked it that I'm not feeling my end and I don't see my, like I see in my eyes only like this, like a wall. I, I can't see from the side of my eyes. So I faked that, that I have, I knew that it's going to, that it's going to make them think that I have a tumor in my head, like pressing on. Wow. I, says, I was clever enough to fake it when I was like eight or nine. And how did you know about the symptoms of cancer? About how to, I, did I you was, know someone? I was very sick? curious. So I read that I read a lot of books, a lot. I think I also heard stories that, you know, like in Haredi houses, you do talk, you hear, you overhear stories from like sickness because it's one of the things that is like depending in life. Like they, they're talking a lot about the life, uh, you know, cycle about uh, who is born, who died and, and a lot of sickness. Uh, that That's, that's what there is a lot in the house. So I may overhear that or read it somewhere. I don't know exactly, but I faked it and, and I suffered really strong because of it. And I think, and I, thinking back, I don't know why I did it. And the only explanation I can, I didn't hate the, the hider so much, you know, like to do okay. it. So the only way it can happen if the, if the sexual abuse that I was, that for sure happened in a later stage also happened in an earlier stage and I don't remember it. So, wow. but for sure the, I had sexual harassment when I was bigger, right? Like after the story with the, and I went then. So what happened? Uh -huh. Yeah. So I went to you a went teacher and I told them, you know, this, this, uh, it's a Rebbe. It's, it's it, the teacher that made the sexual harassment was from a little class. Like it's was from the third class. And, um, so I went to this Rebbe, he was the Rebbe from the seventh class. And I told him because I really liked him. He was just a, you know, a person that I really liked. And I told him the story and he couldn't, he said like, wow, what do you say? Are you sure? You sure he's not just, you know, he likes you. So he's, he's, he hugs you. And I said, no, 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 he's not hugging me. He's like sticking his hands. He's like, you know, doing uh, all kinds of things. Then he says, okay, but take it to the principal and he took it to the principal to the menial and the principal called me and asked me again the old story like is it sure what you told and, blah, blah, blah. and i tell them the old story and he says i can't believe it i can't believe it like this is the only sentence that he kept repeating i can't believe it like you know he's like a as a Khushavin Giman, he's like a, a important figure. And then like after a while he said, you know what, I will handle it. 
And that's it. That's the last I heard from him. Obviously, nothing happened. This uh, teacher is still there. Maybe today he's still there, but uh, nothing happened for years after it. And wow. And yeah, this is a I'm trauma. I'm so sorry. That, that is carrying. horrible. Yeah, that is so horrible. Did you did you since then talk to people in that world about it? Do they know? So I talk to people in this world. Um, but not to people, you know, specifically that know this person, like not people in this hider, in this, uh, I went to the police like, uh, about three years ago and I, uh, obviously complained about this person because I realized I'm going to, there is like, uh, there is a certain amount of years that you can complain. And after this, it's like already a old complaint. So statue of limitations. Yeah. So I added in time. So I complained in time. This means that if but the police can't do anything. They just call them for investigation. And it's my word against his word. You know, they didn't even they didn't even contact or told me if they contact, you know, like first stop him to be a teacher, right? Like if there's a complaint, he should not be a teacher. Doesn't matter if he's sitting in prison or not this man shouldn't be a teacher because there's complaints against them. And none of it is done. Like none of it. I didn't hear anything that somebody from, you know, said something or did something for him not to be a teacher. I don't even know if he's today a teacher. And I tried to figure out if he's today a teacher and like, I couldn't, I, I couldn't figure it out, but, but he did, he was called to investigation and he was warned that uh, if it's happening again, obviously, and one thing is good that if another person complains about them, then they can join the cases and then he's going to prison because now these two, they're waiting always for two sources to say the same things, you know, not to just one man against another. Wow. What does, for instance, your mother say to that? Does she know? She knows. Today she knows. Um, she's very sad that I didn't talk to her, but I... To be honest, I don't think it would matter. What would what would happen different? They would go to the principal. The principal would say, yes, I will going to handle it. And that's it. Wow. Like, I, I don't see any difference. How do you feel about it today? Today, I'm carrying a post-trauma from it, but I'm fine. I mean, I learned to handle it. And the post-trauma is not too severe. Like, I don't have, uh, it not makes me not function. But uh, it's still sometimes if there's like other things involved, so it, it breaks and like I have like a panic attack, a really strong one. But like this, it's wow. fine. I had I had like my older in my older ages, I had like more. Uh, I suffered from like uh, social anxiety and stuff that happened from it. But like, except this, like today, I don't have any side effects from it. A lot of people who leave the community who had experienced some kind of abuse make it their life mission to to create change. Do you feel any impetus to try to fight the system, which is a very powerful system at times? I think the system is, is changing there. I was called to speak, to tell my story in a Hasidic uh, seminar for teachers in Israel. So, I mean, they're trying to train their teachers, they're trying to do work today. So I don't think today you need to fight the system so much. You need to fight the system to get justice, this yes, because nobody of these people are sitting in prison. But except the justice, I don't want to... The system is changing. I mean, they change. They don't eat anymore, maybe a little bit, but it's changing. And in the future, it will not be anymore like it was. So I don't feel also as a kind of outsider a place to come and change the community that I'm not anymore a part of it. But I do feel uh. I do feel the the duty to help in any way I can. So if they called me to speak for Rebes, I will go and speak for Rebes and I will say exactly what I think and like I was fighting with them because they they have this idea that everybody that lives the community it's because of sexual stories. They have this idea that everybody that leaves the community had a problem. And because the the community couldn't handle the problem good, 
So that's why they're outside. So that's why today they're trying to change the system. Let's have solutions in order for the people not to leave. That's what they're, they're doing now. Mm-hmm. You know, Bell says like Avas Dublin, they start the organization because they think that if they will treat these problems, the people will not leave. But I think it's bullshit. I think like people will leave anyway and they need to treat the system anyway. Like, I mean, it's two separate issues. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I told these teachers, yeah. I told them like, like you are fencing me. Like somebody asked, that's why, that's the reason why you left. And I said, no, it's nothing to do with it. And like, you're insulting me by even asking it. But, um, but yeah, I think they're living in some kind of a bubble that they think that everybody, like there is no good reason to leave, you know? <laughs> it's a very satisfying narrative. Everyone left because the system failed this particular person, but when the system works perfectly, then you would never leave. Yeah. Meaning in its idealized state, there's absolutely no reason for anyone to leave. And people like believing that instead of accepting that this is one very, very particular way of life that is inevitably not going to work for everyone. Yeah. They're using, you know, they're using always the the thing you know why every other person that lives the community is telling like horrible stories from beating and from like uh, this. So it has to be that it's related. You know they're living because of it. And I'm saying no. The, the people that are living, they have the courage to tell it. But the people inside the community, they don't have the courage to tell it, and they will not stand in front of a camera and saying my community is shit. So that's that's the reason why only people that are living are telling the story. But as much people that are living have the story, you will know that it's only the tip of the iceberg and inside the community is a lot bigger. Uh, I'm not saying that the community is shit. I'm not saying, I'm just saying that they would not admit that the community has a failure. Yeah. You you have a son in the in the Haider system. Are you comfortable knowing that he's in that system? We're going to talk about that in a little bit, yeah. but speaking uh, about the story of your son in a little bit, but speaking in particular of having a child in the system. So I'm very uncomfortable with the system, with the Hasidic system. I still think that even though there is no, probably there is no sexual abuse, there is, but in these levels that it was, and it's getting better, I know that there is a, a lot of other issues, like emotional damage that are made for children, and like uh, there's not enough emotional development for children in the small ages and then like a lot of people like i growing up like without emotional tools to handle the world because they weren't nobody was thinking that they need to have these tools and but one thing that uh, first i can't do anything about it and second i think he's growing up in a community that is like probably the best from all like i think bells and also carly in the community that i grew up are two communities that are trying really hard to, you know, bridging the gap between modernity and Hasidism and, you know, handle the world as it is. So I think this is good communities to be uh, growing up as a Hasid. So I'm at least happy about it. Uh huh. So let's let's talk more about how that came to be. So what what happened when you were? Did you get engaged when you were eighteen? I was engaged when I was yeah 18 and a half, probably. Um, so the usual thing is that you get engaged when you are in Shir Gimel, uh, in Shivik Doile, uh, you're, uh, the third year of the second yeshiva. You have a first yeshiva, it's called Yeshivik Tane, and a second yeshiva called Yeshivik Doile. And the, in every yeshiva, you have three years, and in the third year of Yeshivik Doile, you get engaged. But you get engaged already from the finish, from the second class, from the second year and then the the ages from the from the book and the ages from the boys there are changing because some people some boys are bigger some boys are like you know like none it's like the whole year right so i was from the smaller ones i was i had actually bar mitzvah in the yeshiva so my bar mitzvah was when i was the first year in the yeshiva like the first uh, so i was very very small uh, so I was always growing up with people bigger for me. So yeah, I was engaged uh, when I was 18 and a half. What, what was the process? 
of your engagement. Were you excited? Yeah, I was very excited because like, like I told you, I was the smallest, um, uh, probably the smallest. And I was uh, every, the youngest. The youngest, yeah. And everybody was uh, was getting engaged before me. Not everybody, but a lot of people, uh, a lot of boys get engaged before me. And it was like, it's always a competition in the yeshiva who gets engaged first. And there is like, you know, it's like a regret, a crest to be independent also because you're always in the yeshiva. And when you get engaged, you're already you don't uh, have to show so much because you have already something promised for you. And then you get engaged and you, you, you're going to your own way. Basically you have a house, you have a family, you're going from your father and your mother and it's independence. And you had a lot more freedom. Yeah. And which uh, teenager doesn't want to be more independent? Everybody. So yeah, this is the way to be independent. And I don't understand. I don't think they know what, uh, marriage is supposed to mean, but uh, you know, like marriage for them is like to build a family. This is this is the true essence of marriage, right? To build a family. So, how many times did you meet the girl before you got married? So, in my community, like in most of the Hasidic communities, um, there's one meeting before the marriage, and then maybe in the engagement, some places. And they before the engagement, you have half an hour that you can talk. Um, so it happened also like this. It was obviously a match and, um, my mother, was it the first girl? Was it the only girl you met? The only girl I met. Yeah. The first girl. Um, but not the first shidduch that was, uh, was his given getrug. Yeah. Not the first shidduch that was proposed. Um, because like, you know, so the system works always. There is like somebody is proposing a shidduch. It can be like a matchmaker. It can be just a neighbor or somebody. Somebody is proposing. And then the parents are doing a lot of checkups to see if the family is standing in the standards from the community. If, you know, um, there's a lot of standards that uh, needs to be checked before you go through. And then there is also a check from, uh, in Israel, it's called Dori Sharim. It's like a DNA test that uh, basically is testing if you are, because of the Ashkenazic genome, uh, we have a problem because for a long time we get married one another in Europe. So um, there's a big chance to have uh, some diseases if you're not careful. So that's why they are doing a DNA test. Again, because everything is family oriented, right? Like you don't do a shidduch because of love. You are getting married because you need to have children. You have to, you need to make a family. And then after you have all of the checkups done, she's fitting the bill, she's fitting the community, she's fitting the family, um, and the DNA is good. Then you go, you go through, and one of the sides is seeing her. First, you see a picture. Then the mother goes to see her. Then the f- then the father uh, doesn't see her. The mother goes to see her, and then the mother goes to see me. Like the other side, mother, like my mother-in-law is coming to see me at a wedding or something like just for the distance. And then there is a, and then there is a, a trefle. Then, then there is the a a meeting. meeting. You don't call it a show? A show, Yeah. Uh, not in my, okay. not in my community. Um, it's a trefle. Uh, yeah. Interesting. A gisha, or it's a, some, so, sometimes they say gisha, like in Hebrew. Gisha, yeah. gisha in Hebrew. Yeah. 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 So you were on track to be in the system, essentially. What happened? You got married? So yeah, and... I, I, so I went through and um, I didn't find the reason uh, why to say no, you know, for the Shidduch, it was good. She, she looked good in my eyes. Like everything was, family looked good. Like, and like, you know, the only thing you're talking about is like, you know, you want to have a family and children. Oh, I want to. You want to, you know, like we will, we belong also to the same community. We belong both to Karlin Stollen. So it was a good match. And there isn't even like, you know, I interchange between communities. So there is nothing yeah, debatable even, you know, like, uh, and always also if there is an interchange, uh, I interchange community, she there. So always the woman is going after the man. I mean, like. You send the kids to the, yeah. like, now you, you, if you're with Vizhnitz, for example, you belong to the Vizhnitz community, 
So now you're married, you man, and you man is belt, so you belong now to belt. So that's that's how it works. So yeah. there's no a lot of conflict if the color agrees to be now belt. So the yeah, color is the, the bride. bride yeah. The color is if the bride, bride ex- accepted to be belt now, so she is belt now. So yeah, we didn't have any conflict, any, any dispute, and it was looking very good. So we went for the shidduch. And uh, yeah, a little bit later, like uh, I think it was. What, what are? Sorry, I'm interrupting you. What are the customs for for grooms in Israel? Do they also give pens and cigarettes? Um, yes, but not in my community. My community, the, the, in Karlin, the Rebbe is very much against smoking. Nobody in Karlin smokes. Um, nobody. I really? mean, it's exaggerating, but ninety nine of the people are not smoking. Ninety nine percent of the people. Because in New York, very few, much fewer Hasidic men smoke than in oh, Israel. Oh yeah, in Israel, everybody smokes. Um, not everybody, a lot, a lot. Um, I don't know about percentage, <laughs> but he's very against it. Uh, also because he grew up in America, the Rebbe, but also because um, uh-huh. he's very scientific kind of. It's like if science says you shouldn't smoke, you shouldn't smoke. It's not healthy. Very I smart see. Thing, you know. How how was he about the lockdown? Was he different from the other groups? Oh, and... different. He was very he was un... very with a mask from the first second. Said for all of the Hasidim, the these pictures of them dancing in COVID with like uh, gautlech in between, holding gautlech and like really? bags and like chairs, and like he was very careful. Uh, but uh, yeah, and closed the immediately closed everything when they said you should be closed and. Uh, yeah, the Kalin Rebbe was very careful. A lot of a lot of the um, ac- accusations of Hasidim being so-called anti-science will come from people who say there's so much censorship of what you can read and what you can watch. Of course, you didn't grow up with television, and you don't watch movies, and you don't. I'm guessing you don't read the secular Israeli newspapers. How how come he is different, the the Stalin Karlina Rebbe? Then, like how how did he come to be different? I don't think there is a lack of information. To be honest, I will tell you why. Yeah, because I don't think it's either. very easy. The Rebbe needs to read the news. He doesn't even need to read the news. He has people that are reading the news for him, right? So you just need to have a person that reads the news for the Rebbe, and then the whole community is fixed. The the I think the problem is not there. The because. When the Rebbe says something, the whole community knows about it. So there's no problem in transferring information. The problem is if the Rebbe's are, it's the attitude to the science. It's not the the ability to access yeah. science. And it's always the problem from how much independent is the Rebbe himself. And if the Rebbe is independent, he knows science. If the Rebbe is not independent, if he's like, if the people around them are managing him a little bit, then it's bad because then there is interest in it, and then there it's and it's like this. The Belzer Rebbe is a very independent Rebbe, and he does whatever he wants. And they keep and it's very pro science and very pro technology and very. The Karlin Rebbe is the same, and you see it also. I'm not going to name other communities, but you can see it in the spectrum of communities as much more of uh, independent as as much less independent you are the likelihood of having uh, of being scientific or technological is like going downhill. I don't know. I mean, I, the Satmar Rebbe, Rebbe Aaron Teitelbaum, uh, which is the community that I come from, he seems to me to be a very independent minded person. He's just not one who, who um, his attitude towards the official sanctioned uh, views of, let's say on COVID or, certain things are going to are going to be different. He's going to argue that the community has different needs and those needs supersede um the needs that that have been sanctioned by that have been proposed by the government. So I, I find that he formulates fairly coherent ideas about what he thinks is right for the community. I don't like to talk about specific rebels negative, but I will ask you <laughs> you're going to get in trouble. Uh, no, but I will ask you one thing. And it's true for all Rebbes. If he, Rebbe Titleboim, is deciding now that the Moises in Israel are starting to get money from Israel, you know, like the community is very anti-Zionist. If Rebbe Titleboim yeah, yeah. thinks now, you know, it's let's stop being anti-Zionist for now. Now we should move to a different direction. 
now we should be pro-Zionist. Is it going to fly? Is the community going to stay with them? Yeah. No. So it's restricted. It's not independent. That's the reason. If the Karlina Rebbe or the Belder Rebbe decide tomorrow that we are becoming anti-Zionist and like we stop getting money from the government, everybody is in a blink, like in a blink of an eye fixing mitem. It depends how much you are controlling your community. This is the, the thing. I see what you're saying. I think I think there is more to it. In in South Mar- first of all, South Mar- are known to be to some degree mavericks, but I think there's also a very important legacy within which every Rebbe operates. People give deference to the first Satma Rebbe, Rebbe Yol Teitelbaum, and every subsequent Rebbe has to kowtow to that. You can't say we're now changing what the Satma Rebbe said because people are very in tune with what the original Satma Rebbe said. So there's there's very strong connection to the legacy. I know. But it's very interesting. Yeah, it's all it's it's all conversation. Yeah. But I think it's it's all exactly. I think I think it that that's the that's the point. I'm not saying you should you know go like saying the free edikasat merabe is given shlech. Not this because then you will be shunned. But slowly change the way of the community. You can do it, and like a lot of rebbes did it. Even Vishnitz did it in a certain extent. But the Vishnitz rebbe from today is like uh, kind of independent, but. Yeah, it's a, it's a different topic. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. Yeah, it is interesting. I would love to talk it out. We're, we're, we just want to stay yeah. on topic of the interview because I feel like it is a very interesting topic um, and a lot to think about. We were talking about um, your your own My life. My marriage, yeah. You want to pick up on yeah. that? Your marriage. So, yeah. So, uh, then uh, I've gotten married after uh, six months probably. I don't remember. Did you see your college, your, your bride during the no, engagement? No, I didn't see her during the engagement. Um, I see her when I, before the engagement himself, like uh, for the vote, yeah. Uh, uh, and for like half an hour, 20 minutes, and then before, uh, and then in, when I came to the Badek. So when I came to the wedding to uh, cover, cover her, you know, like the traditional custom. And yeah, I had a very happy chasene, uh, also because I'm my only boy. Uh, so a very happy uh-huh. marriage. Uh, and a lot, of, lot people came. of people came. So, you know, like traditionally a Hasidic chasene, a Hasidic marriage is like a lot of people because the families are so big and the community is coming. And yeah, so I had a lot more. Like I have thousands on, upon thousands of people coming to the wedding because I was... Uh, I was a single boy and like everybody knew this is the only chance to come to a wedding that uh, my father is doing, you know, uh, my parents. Yeah. Did you drink at the wedding? Drink alcohol, you mean? No, wine probably. Maybe, maybe I did. No, maybe a little bit, not too much. Yeah, no, no I wasn't. So before the wedding, I was... I was a very good boy, you know, in the yeshivas and everything. I was, uh, I, I was studying really good. I was very smart. I was, uh, but I wasn't fitting the system. You know, the same problem that I had uh, as a child. I wasn't fitting the system exactly, and I was very devoted and very like you know, chaniok uh, zukt men in Yiddish. You say I don't know how to translate this word. I, I guess, Almost like an extremist. Pious, pious. No, what else? Ah, uh, pious. Yeah. I was very devoted to the system and to the Rebbe and to the, you know, Hasidus, uh, the Hasidic ideas, and uh, I was very knowledgeable. Uh, uh, knowledgeable, you say? Uh, knowledgeable. knowledgeable. Yeah, I, I knew a lot of stuff. Uh, I was a kind of a good mass mid. I was staying up until like uh, two o'clock at night to study and wake up at five to study. I, I was uh, almost non-sleeping, but from the other side, I really liked my uh, independency. And when I was in the yeshiva, I liked to escape to, you know, Kivret Tzadikim, to, like in Israel, it's a thing. I don't know if in, in America, it's probably not a thing. In Israel? I don't think so. In Yerushalayim, we have even a word for it, Gain Jaren, Er Jaret. It's like, this is the word. Meaning like, I think it's maybe from Arabic or like from, it's, but it's used in Yiddish. Ergait Jaren. It means like he's going to uh, Kivret Tzadikim. Like, you know, he's going... 
to the grave sites of, of sages. Yeah, but it's not I'm only it's like a broad idea because you can go to the coastal and you can go to uh, uh, to water, you know, like to mikves, old mikves. You can go to lots of heritage places that are like, you know, interesting. And uh, you can go to kumzits in, in Israel. Like I think the idea from a kumzits come from Israel, you know, to sit together uh, around some and to, to sing, sing with, a with guitar, a guitar. And stuff. so you can do this and and when you become like a teenage you want to do it this is like the equivalent of going to parties like you know like it's doing like uh, uh-huh. uh yeah so so that's that's and some alcohol is involved here and there but not too much like we are not like uh you know secular uh, teenagers uh, trying uh that are trying, they have more access. Uh, like, you know, there's this fetish about like finding alcohol when you are in America, at least, uh, how you see it in movies, at least. <laughs> I, I asked, I asked because I'm working on, on a segment about Hasidic uh-huh. weddings and I'm watching all these YouTube videos and there seems to be a lot of very lively dancing. And uh, which, to some degree, there seems to be alcohol involved, but Let's move along. Yeah. So the dancing is a different story. Dancing, like, uh, you know that I'm a dancer and I'm teaching it. And dancing in the community was very, oh. was very strong thing. And the dancing is a thing by Hasidim. It's like, it's a way of worshiping, right? Like, it's a way of, uh, so it's like uh, almost a principle in the, in the Hasidic behavior. So I think, I think just the modern people more are getting involved in alcohol in it. But the non-modern people are dancing without alcohol. It's more open you uh-huh. are, there's more but in Chabad, which is a different Hasidic community, the drinking is a part of it. Like you drink in its vides, you drink when you sit together the Hasidim and talk and uh, sing. And, so you do drink. Um so there is drinking, but not, not I think not too much. So so from one side I was uh, you know, very uh, I studied a lot and I was a very mass meet. But then I had my independent way, you know, to go to these places. And I had this, my own ideas, like, you know, for Mesiris Nefesh, for Chesed, like to giving out your soul for uh, Chesed, for doing a good deed, charity, sure. doing a good deed. For it. So, you know, in every community, there is like this organization that are uh, organizing the events and doing, uh, and doing uh, charity stuff, you know going visit sick people or like doing so i was very involved in these organizations too and organizing the events from the community so it was a conflict because i wasn't by the look i wasn't this shababnik that is you know going with all of the keys and the beepers and like doing all of this kind of stuff but i did this all of this kind of stuff and then went and studied like four hours uh you know like uh I, I can't even start to explain what is it to study in a yeshiva. It's like a bubble. It's a different world. And like a stranger can almost not understand it because when, you, when you're when you in yeshiva, you're studying from the first moment you're waking up until you're going to sleep. You're studying for 12 hours and sometimes more. Right? Like you're studying, you're waking up at six, you're going to the mikveh, the ritual bath, and then you're going to prayer. You pray for an hour, you eat for half an hour, and then you go study and you study until noon. And and then you have a little break at noon for like an hour, an hour and a half. And then you go immediately to study again. You pray in Minche, another prayer for like 20 minutes, and then you go you study again until until like seven. Then you have Mayriv, usually you're praying another prayer from another 20 minutes, and then you study again until nine. So we are from six, six in the morning already until nine. When this is the, this is, everybody does it. Okay. Everybody does it. And then if you are a good boy, so you need to add some time. So you study also before six, you're waking up like at four or at five and you go to the mikveh and then you study before the prayer. And then you also stay later at night. Everybody finishes to study at nine, but you stay until like uh, 10, 11, 12, one, two. Some people are staying until two. And I was this kind of uh, boy, staying very late, wow. waking up very early. But in some days, I just, instead of studying, I went to, you know, to Kivret Sadiki. I went to Graves <laughs> and doing Kumzitzim and stuff. So I, I was a very weird uh, person because I had like a, I contradict my own behavior. From one side, I was a very good boy, like almost extreme good. But from the other side, I just f- fuck the system, you know, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I see. So you you instead of spending all your hours studying, you'd go to Kumsitz or yeah, whatever. Or doing like charity, making, uh, you know, like drinks for everybody that come to the Rebbe or building tents or like doing stuff. Yeah, weird stuff. I yeah. see. Uh, this was after your this marriage? This was before my marriage. Um, so why did I uh, say that? I don't know. So, so yeah, so my... Uh, then I get, I've gotten married, and I think this was also a part of the problem that ended my marriage because I was I was an unbeatable cookie. Like I, like people didn't know how to handle me. Like I was very, again, like I had this contradiction, and like I still have it until I think I still have it. I'm mean, just like I'm a very good boy, but I like to do very extreme things from the other end. Is is going to to Kumsitz is so extreme? No, because some so, some of the Kumsitz is from the yeshiva, but I always stretch the limit. So, for example, there is uh-huh. like we are talking now about like uh, the situation in Israel, right? So there is like going to a Kumsitz, but and there is going to the Koisel, like you know, going to the Western the world, the Western world, to play. World. But then there is also ditch all day to go to Shrem to the Tzien of Yosef Atzadik, um, meaning like uh, Yosef y- Yosef Atzadik, one uh, Joseph, I don't know how to call him in English, Joseph, one of the tribes, is assumingly living uh, buried in Shrem. Buried. What is Nablus in uh, in in English? So he's buried in Shrem, and and it's like a very Muslim, uh, like you know, Arab population there, and very anti-Israel. Like there's a lot of attacks coming from Nablus, and uh, you know there is like they are going in with the army, like some the Zionist the team, the very extreme right wing groups, religious groups are trying to go in and pray there. They're going in, and every time they're going in, there is like you know the army needs to go with them, and it like so. It's just one little example. So I ditched all day to go there, and it's also dangerous, and also uh, you know like kind of I don't know right wing extremists. I don't know. And then I um, wow. I I could have ditched like two weeks to go to Miron where Rab Shimon is before like Boimer to build. The all compound for uh, for the community, so like ditching two weeks from the yeshiva, like hundred of and and not having any uh-huh. consequences because he didn't know how to handle me, so I didn't suffer any consequences. I just showed up again, and that's it. I mean, now here, like interesting. You you have a little bit of a of a thirst for adventure in life. No, I think so. <laughs> I think so. <sighs> interesting. So. You, um, how old were you when you became a father? Became a father, 19 in, not 19 and a half, 19 and a half, 20. Yeah. After the wearing, I was, it was, I think it was like nine months or seven months until we got pregnant. And then like we got pregnant and then, yeah. But she left, my wife left the house when uh, she was pregnant with the child. She left the house and then she came back and then she left again and then she came back and then, and then, uh, the birth happened when we were together, like she didn't left. And then after the birth, she was just staying in, uh, in her parents' house because this is the normal custom after, after, uh, in the first child, at least, uh, the wife is going to stay with her mother just to add to have help. And that's it. She left there and I, I saw him for like a while, my child, for like three months. Um, also, like I can count on one end how much time I saw him, like how much visitors I had. And then I didn't saw him. So just didn't allow me to come back. And after a while, they also just, they left the apartment. They like just disappeared, changed forms, uh, just disappeared. Wow. And and what you got divorced? Yeah, after uh, I think almost two years after I I got divorced and finally I got divorced and uh, and then you left and then I don't see him anymore. Wow, is this what precipitated your leaving the fold altogether? I don't think so, although 
when I was, so I was always curious, like I said, and I always trying new horizons, but I was very strongly believing. And also after she left and also like after the divorce, I was very strongly believing in God, in, you know, um, I think it's, it gave, it gave me at least the possibility to try. Like I didn't have the responsibility of having a family meet me in the journey, but it's a lot harder. Um, but I don't think it was because of it or as a result from it. I think it's just, it was a little bit easier for me to do it because I, I was divorced and I didn't have a family. Do you, do you want to talk about, I, I feel like this is a very personal question about your marriage coming to an end, your first marriage. But I guess, I guess, yeah. Yeah, it was very painful. I did, I, um, I didn't want my uh, marriage to come to an end. I was invested all in, uh, but it happened. And, um, you know, she left the house of minor things. Like she left the house because I was listening to radio and like this kind of stuff. So obviously it didn't work for her. And I will not talk in her name, uh, you know, but probably it wasn't fitting for her. And uh, like I said, I was hard cookie to eat. I wasn't, uh, I, w- I, I didn't make it easier. So it ended, you know, but I was heartbroken after it. I was heartbroken and I was also heartbroken from the fact that uh, I couldn't see my child. And the reason is uh, why I don't see my child, to be honest, I don't know. But But the big picture is that in every divorce in the Hasidic community, it's complicated because there is a lot of uh, machers, askunim, a lot of uh, mediators involved. Activists, yeah, fingers and in the pie. There is the families, and you are a teenager basically, and she is a teenager, and it's like then the community is involved, and the rabbi is involved, and like there is always. Uh, there isn't an easy way out, and there is a big stigma on people that are divorced. A big, uh, and and then the, when you go to the law, the law is a recommendation and the system goes through Betadinim, through like uh, court, like uh, law, the Jewish, the Jewish court, the other court. inside court. And it's usually very corrupted. And I'm saying it out loud. I, I really like the Hasidic community. I really like the, the you know, the, the, I really like the the environment. I like the people, but there is things that you know I have a strong criticism against it. And the Jewish court is one of the things. There's just no law, no just no justice there. The rabbinic uh, system of judging in uh, family is like very corrupted because they're always they will go like they go with this uh, excuses. You know, a child needs his mother. And they go with this axiomas that uh, the child needs to be where uh, where he can be more religious, and all of this kind of stuff affects the judgment. And there is always a fight. And then when you have like corrupt, corrupted lawyers also in the meantime, so there is toyanim. It's called. This is the Jewish uh, the Jewish lawyers. Lawyers. And they are usually also corrupted. They don't even know they are corrupted. They sometimes not even putting attention. Right, like. It's not that I think that they've gotten money in order of making a big deal, a, a bad deal for me. But my Toyen, probably just, he was a student from the other Toyen. He was a student from the other lawyer. So they just, I think they just closed the deal between them. And then the Rebbe also said that I should give up my child. And so it, to be to be straight, it's not legal in Israel, not to the contract that we did, but we did it. And the rabbinic court is accepting it. And if the rabbinic court is accepting it, so then the the court, you know, the normal court is also accepting it. So again, it's not legal for a normal court, but if the rabbinic court does it, the illegal thing, then it's acceptable. Wow. Um, and that's what happened. Uh, so the deal is like, I don't pay and I don't see, right? Like I don't, uh, like I'm basically 
cut off from the from from him, and I I have nothing to do with him anymore. Like at, at least until he's big, right? And I'm waiting in OP, and and I'm not allowed to contact them also. Um, what do you mean I'm not allowed? I'm, if I'm contacting them, I need to pay in retrospective. I need to pay all of the all of the mezoinus, all of the money, with like I with a with the interest. Interest. And not even me. It's like I have like people that are raving, you know, people that sign up for me that they will pay if I don't. So I and like they have my family. So I, I'm put, they're putting me in this position that if I'm opening the case, like not only I'm going to suffer, my family is going to suffer and everything is going to pay a lot of money in order not to see him in the end. Because in the end, if they don't want me to see him, I will not see him. That's the truth. Wow. Uh, and, and I will just pay this all amount of money for me not to see him. That's that that that's the way it behaves. It's, it's nothing specific about my wife or about the family. That's the way divorce in the Hasidic community works. Wow. I I think even even when people stay, sometimes because when there's divorce, there's quick remarriage. They want the child to be with one whole family, so to speak. So they they'll often. Um, agitate, even when there's nothing to do with leaving the faith, they'll agitate for the children to, let's say, if they're staying with a mother, to be, to only have a relationship with the mother and the stepfather, which is usually um, what happens soon after the mother remarries their stepfather, and, and to create a, a normal life for the child, they ask the the biological father not 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 to want visitation, not to disrupt the so-called normal yeah. life. It, is that something you experience as well? Yeah, that's why they demanded it from the first moment that I wouldn't see the child. I wasn't even secular. I wasn't nothing. <laughs> but before, before I went out, before everything, they demanded that I would not see the child. And why in the hell you do it? At least you have this axioma. Like they see it as like a kid needs to have a family. And if he needs to see a second father, it's not a family anymore. It's like uh, breaking the system. It's breaking the, you know, black and white system from uh, having a family with one father and one mother. And this is not okay. Well, what can I do? Um, So I know I, I, I talked in interviews about this and a lot of time people are saying in comments, they're saying mean comments like, uh, uh, you know, like you should need to fight. You go to the car. I have a cousin that did that or whatever. Like I'm telling you, you, every, every story is different, but I'm, if I tell you, there is nothing to do about it. There's nothing to do about it. Like I have so much experience and so much friends that are not seeing the children to know that that's, that's the deal. I, I have also a lot of friends that are paying a lot of money every month and not seeing the child and also paying for court and lawyers and, and also not seeing the child. Like I have, the, I, I know friends like this also. So it's a very complicated situation. Um, I don't want to not see the child and also be broke and enable of not be able to, to all them when he was be when he will be big and they will need my support. Right? Like I don't want to do both. <laughs> want to be bro- Yeah. So it's a very complicated issue. And I think if you have a friend that doesn't see, just let let them handle them the issue. Don't don't give advice. Yeah. I know people can't yeah. resist. So after that is when you you moved out. You sort of what happened? You moved to Tel Aviv and you said, I'm growing these locks in the back that you have, the five the five pies six. instead of the ones over here. <laughs> six? Oh, six. Um, but wait a second. I want to finish the... I, I, I do want to talk to my child that will probably one day will see the video. And I do want to say to him that my door is open and it was always open and my heart is always open. And I my screen and my telephone is his picture. I don't want to show it uh, because uh, I don't have permission. And I think of him every day and 
I'm just waiting for him to contact me and um and you know and from my side he can come leave here with me. But uh yeah, the situation is difficult, but I miss him very much. Very hard. I have to say, having seen the picture, he's a lovely kid. Yeah. But now you're all the way in Canada and he's yeah. in Israel. And uh, this this is a, a yeah. one of the reasons you ask me why I'm uh, so worried and stuff. He's there, my parents are there, my sister is there, I meet all my nephews. It's like the whole family, my grandmother, my grandfather. Like it's like the, the whole, you know, the whole tribe is there. Um yes, uh-huh. my wife in luckily enough, like we live in Canada now and my wife and child are now here. My second child, I mean. Okay, so so let's because we've already gone for an hour and fourteen minutes. Um, can can you wrap up by telling us about your life story since that after after you lost touch with your first son? Um, yeah. So after I uh, I've gotten divorced, I uh, decided you know like let's be as a straight book you know like let's go and uh, try the secular world and. I went, you know, like I, I thought about academy. I want to be in the academy. And I went to several places, uh, at interviews, you know, like if they will accept me. And the problem is because you don't have education, you need to do a pre-academy school, like in order to get the education mm-hmm. needed. Um, because in... But you did, you did have language skills because you speak Hebrew yeah. fluently. Yeah, yeah. I do have language skills in Israel, at least. Uh, I was very good in Hebrew. I really, my mom is a teacher of uh, literature, of Hebrew literature. And I, so I'm very good in Hebrew. And I think all of the Hasidim from Israel, that they know Hebrew good, they know Hebrew better from the Israelis, from the normal uh, Israeli, because they know uh, Talmudic Hebrew, they know, uh, uh, you know Bible Hebrew, they know... Eastern European Hebrew, they know a lot of kinds of Hebrew, and they know Aramaic, and they know they have a lot of knowledge, but they can read Rashi letters, they can read old texts, so they are a lot more educated from the regular guy on the street that speaks only modern Hebrew. Um, So there is advantage, nothing, but but there is also like you don't know much, and you don't know uh, anything about nature, and you don't know, yeah, so there is fundamental things that you need to uh, catch up. Yeah, and then you need to read Harry Potter, and you need to you, you need to know anything basic about the world culture. Uh, so I went to the academy, um, and I was trying to get in, and they said, told me you need to do the army first because you can't just go straight to the academy. So I went straight to the army, and uh, I was in the army for uh, three years. I was a social worker in the army, in charge of the Haredi people in the army. Uh, like, you know, the social rights and stuff. And during the army, I found the museum, the Yiddish museum in Israel, and that I today uh, run together with Mendy Khan. And, but this is the, the place that opened my horizon to not want to be a secular Israeli guy, but emerge the two worlds to what I am today, to emerge it to to be a secular Hossi, as I call myself today. Um, and to... Which means what? Which means being secular, meaning non, not religious. Yes, believing in God, not believing in God. This, that, it's not the question, but not following any of the religious law, not believing in the religious law. How? And being Hossi, meaning... Um, following the Hasidic behavior, like the Hasidic movement is is a movement that started in Europe. I'm not going to talk about the Hasidic movement, but to follow the, it's a psychological movement. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of behaving. It's a day to day. It's like you know the life in the community. Um, it's a way of thinking about the world and about the person in the world. And but it's not only a philosophical movement. It's a very practical everyday uh, thing and it has a lot of customs around it that I preserve so I'm very traditional in in the customs that I'm doing but 
I'm not religious. I'm not doing it from the religious uh, perspective. I'm doing it because the heritage is important to me. My Ashkenazi identity is important to me. My, uh, you know, fam- my family's life back, way back in Europe, a hundred years, is very important to me. So that's why I'm doing this kind of stuff because I'm trying to preserve the culture, to preserve and teach on the the culture that I grew up and affected my life until now. That that's secular chassid. Interesting. I I relate to some degree. Uh, something that I find is uh, sometimes a challenge is Hasidic people kind of claim ownership of a lot of customs. It's like y- you don't have a right to part of it goes all together and they might be offended if you preserve a part of it without subscribing to the whole... Yeah. Obviously, they're going to laugh it off. What does it mean, a secular Hasidic? Obviously, they, yeah. they, will, they are not yeah, accepting yeah. the idea, but from outside and from inside, because I'm also inside, but I'm also outside now, there is more to the Hasidic tradition from just being religious. And actually, they went almost opposite of religious in certain aspects, certain aspects, not in everything. But let's leave this conversation out. So this brought me... Yeah, we can talk forever about these yeah, things. So this brought me to my uh, current life that... Uh, Everything I do in my current life is around, uh, it's not a belief, but it's around this tradition and is in the effort to to try and protect it and to do more in it. So that's why I'm uh, I'm working in the Yiddish Museum and I'm a huge collector myself. Like I, I have a huge collection. Like my my enjoyment is in life is like to have books from like 1600, 1700 and reading it. Like I can do it for hours. Like, building bibliographies, uh, that's what I do. Um, but also, uh, you know, dancing in the Hasidic behavior and teaching dance and performing in theater and uh, dealing with all of the things that the Ashkenazi culture and the Hasidic culture contributed during the years to the, to the world of art and to the world of culture. Nigunim and uh, all of this folklore, you can say. The language, the Yiddish, uh-huh. the, yeah. I have two more questions and then we have to wrap it up. Um, did you like at some point tell your parents that you're no longer religious? Can I ask you about that? Yeah. I think I did it slowly. Um, and this is also the recommendation for all. Like, I think to tell them, like, you know, if I'm a Hossi, the regular Hossi going to pray and everything. And then like one day coming, mom and dad, listen, like I'm, secular doesn't work because they need a lot of preparation. What do you mean it's you are secular? Like it's need process. They still are part of them. Don't believe that I'm entirely secular. They can tell me sentences like, you know, but like deep inside, if you dig in, how come like you believe in God? Like it can be that you're not believing in God. So they have this attitude and you know it probably like, Deep in the heart, like there is this nitzet, there is this like you know uh, flame, the Jewish flame, the this pink lead, uh, like something yeah, that yeah, is, yeah. A, and like they can't believe there is a different way of looking at what this pink lead is, or what like you know. Yes, I do believe that everybody has some pink lead in them, but what it is, this is a way of discussing it. So I did tell them, yeah, but it's. Uh, they for sure know that I'm not keeping uh, Shabbos and I'm not religious and I'm, I'm not taking kosher, but I'm just trying to avoid to talk to them about it. I'm not going and poke them in the face. And I told them they know, they know enough time. And like, I'm always trying to provoke them also with questions. Like this is just enjoyment, pure enjoyment. Like, you know, the same stuff about God help us. <laughs> like, so where, where is God now with all attacking Gaza and this kind of stuff? So I'm always trying to poke to, you know, like a little bit, but I'm very trying not to poke them, you know, like I just now eat Hazer or like whatever, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happened now? How's, uh, where are you now in life? I want to wrap up by getting yeah. the update. So I live in Canada because um, because of my wife. My wife is Canadian, and the child. The, I have another child, Esreg, which uh, was born. How, how long ago did your wife, you and your wife, get married? So we have gotten married um, in twenty twenty, 
the the legal wearing and then we had a Jewish wearing at in 21 like you know mit a mit a rebe mit a hippe oh, mit nice. mit a strabble and uh, but mit a bloye couple and yeah i was in the hippe mit a kittel and after the hippe i was uh, mit a short uh, mit a kurze rekel mit uh, you know mit a short suit and you know a suit mit a kippa but i changed Yeah, but I changed guy. outfits a few times in the wearing, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was, uh, the religious wearing was totally religious, so it was COVID. So the, uh, the whole story started, like, I work for, for a research organization also uh, in UCL in London that was researching Hasidic Yiddish. So I went, we went both together. My wife is a linguist. Uh, we can say her name, Zoe Belk. And uh, she's researching Hasidic Yiddish and we met in the, in, in the Young Yiddish Museum in Tel Aviv because she came to research Yiddish there as a postdoctor uh, for, from Yiddish. And then I was got, they, the project hired me, uh, Professor uh, Esther Sendroy and Professor Lili Khan hired me to work in the same project and uh, the Shida happened there. Uh, I mean, Zoe was working for the project and uh-huh. I was working for the project and that's how we knew each other. And uh, that's how Very the Shidduch nice. uh, went. And then after a while, we went to make interviews in uh, a lot of places. We were in New York when uh, COVID happened. And then we couldn't come back to Israel because Zoe doesn't have a citizenship and everything changed. And so we decided to stay in Canada. And that's why we came to Canada. Uh, Zoe is obviously Canadian. Um, and since then, we are just living here. And we bought a house, this, uh, this nice house. Um, oh, yeah, lovely. it's a low carbon from oh, 1852. A very nice house, old, like I like old stuff. So uh, this is an old house. And Zoe is going to teach Yiddish in the university in, UC, uh, in, the, in Miguel, here in Montreal. And I am working uh, to open here a Yiddish museum, also a branch from the museum that I'm working to open here. I work for the League for Yiddish, which is an organization in New York. And I'm doing a lot of uh, Yiddish stuff and dancing stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and th- that's, that's the life. Yeah. Lovely. And you have a growing little kid. And I have a little kid, yeah, called Esreg, uh, the Jewish name, Robin, the non-Jewish name, Robin. What is the non-Jewish so like name? Like Robin Hood? Like, a, like the bird? Yeah, like the bird. Like Robin Hood, oh. Um, yeah, and oh. he's two years old, just that two. And uh, yeah, we are here for now. Wow, lovely. True Nachas. <laughs> in, in its own journey. Um, did you enjoy giving me the tour of B'nai Barak? Yeah, I, I'm always uh, enjoying the tour, but this was a special tour. And it was also special because we filmed that, so we could have actually gone to places that is a little bit different from my regular tour. You know, because we could go in a car to other places and yeah, have different settings. And yeah, so it was very exciting. Yeah, how about tell us, tell us for a second about your tour and, and then we'll, we'll say goodbye. About your experience giving tours. Yeah. So when I was in Israel, I uh, really liked to uh, giving tours in B'nai Brak. It started actually by uh, in the army. Uh, the uh, organization that is semi-army thing, they are helping for like lonely soldiers. It's called Soldiers Without a Family Background. So they wanted to know the, the Hasidic world to in order of like, you know, they have a lot of people like me growing up Hasidic in the army now. So they wanted to have like a exposure for the volunteers. So they asked me to do a tour in Bnei Brak. This was my first tour in Bnei Brak. Um, and I really enjoyed it. And I kind of found the rhythm to talk in respect about the Hasidic world and passion because I'm passionate about the Hasidic way of life and about the culture and about the place I grew up. And also having criticized and uh, this was my first tour, so they needed to understand also the problematic in growing up, growing up in this culture and then coming to the secular culture. So yeah, we talked about everything. And since then, I did the tour multiple times, uh, also to uh, uh, groups, also to uh, private people. And I really enjoyed to have it now filmed. 
Uh, this was a unique opportunity. It's, wow. Yeah. Lovely, lovely. It was it was a real pleasure. It was a, a very it was a very special experience, especially with what happened afterwards to know that yeah. feel like I've been there on, yeah. on its soil. Ellie, where can people find you? Oh, this is a good question. So the best thing is by email or WhatsApp. Um, I don't have a website. Um, I kind of did want to, yeah, I did want to make a YouTube canal, but I now I don't say YouTube raised the bar, so I don't know if I'm going to do it. Um, I will, I do have a YouTube channel that I'm running for the league for Yiddish. So this will be good. You can check out there. I'm, I'm doing interviews. I'm interviewing a lot of people around the topic is Yiddish, but all of the interviews are in Yiddish. Um, some of that are, have the subtitles to English, not everything has uh, subtitles to Yiddish, but if you are a Yiddish lover and you know Yiddish, this is the place for you. Um, and there, there is a YouTube channel for the young Yiddish place, but that's I, there is not much me there. But if you write to the young Yiddish email or to my personal email, you can get to me. Um, so yeah, I guess if you want to have a dance class or you want to show more, uh, see more about uh, the Jewish dancing or you want to know more about Yiddish, you can write to me. I will be happy to help. If you want to see my neighbor, you can do to see my neighbor with me, but only when I'm in Israel. So this is this is the uh, this is the downside yeah, of it yeah. that uh, that now I can't do a lot of to see my neighbor. Yeah, that's why that's why I came. I knew you were going to be there. I'm not a big traveler, but I really wanted to catch you. But maybe there will be other tour goers as dedicated as me. <laughs> so we're putting that out there as well. Well, thank you so much, Ellie. Thanks it was such a pleasure for to the talk pleasure to you again. To be here.